All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met before, I'm Miranda Hitchcock. I'm one of the founders of Every Dog Behavior and Training. So we're actually a nonprofit in town. We opened this year and our goal is to make dog training and behavior resources accessible and inclusive to the Austin community. We know that a lot of folks don't seek out behavior professionals either until there's something serious going on or they don't seek them out at all because of finances or not having someone who speaks their language, a whole variety of different factors. So we really wanna make sure that we're able to reach the people who often don't have access to behavior resources in the community. Um, so we're really excited about doing that. And one of our goals is to make sure that everybody has access to cool behavior information from some of our awesome local trainers and behavior experts. Um, so we do webinars about twice a month on a variety of behavior topics from local trainers here um, in Austin. And we also have a monthly uh, new dog owner workshop. So it doesn't have to be for first time dog owners, but anyone who's recently gotten a dog and it kind of goes over basic information. So if you know anyone who's interested in that, definitely let them know they can sign up online and stay tuned for um, upcoming webinars. We have one on the importance of puppy socialization, um, sort of more from the science perspective and why it's so critical to do uh, coming up, I believe next week actually. Um, so definitely sign up for things online if you haven't already. And we also have uh, free private consultations for anyone in the Austin area. So whether it's a new puppy that you just wanna get set up for success or whether you're having some behaviors issues with your dogs, um, you're welcome to set up an appointment with us. We'll go over some management and training plans um, and then can also refer you on if that's something that we need to do. Um, if you're not already following us on Facebook and Instagram, please do. Um, and that's, I think, all you need to know about me. So without further ado, I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Debbie here. Thank you, Miranda. And let me go ahead and get my screen up. Let's see here. And I'm gonna make this smaller so I can see my screen. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. First of all, I'm excited to be here to talk to people not only in the Austin area, but also from all around. I know I promoted this on my own personal Facebook page as well. So um, I think we probably have some outsiders, not just the Central Texas people. A little bit about me, I'll introduce myself. I'm a certified trainer through Karen Prayer Academy and also um, a certified professional dog trainer knowledge assessed through CCBDT. I'm also a licensed veterinary technician here in the state of Texas. I've been a licensed tech since uh, 1995. Oh my goodness, uh, <laughs> 25 years. That can't be right, can it? Yeah, I guess it is. Uh, I am one of 16 veterinary technician specialists in behavior in the world. Uh, we're a small specialty at this point, although we have a lot more people applying as behavior is becoming more well known in the veterinary field. Part of that is because of Fear Free. So I have been working with fearfreepets.com. So Fear Free Pets is the kind of the educational side of things for pet professionals, whether you be a veterinarian or a trainer. Um, it also, what we realized when we first started launching Fear Free and educating veterinarians, especially on the fact that the emotional well-being of the pets that they were taking care of was really important, is that we realized that pets actually spend very little time in the veterinary hospital, hopefully. Uh, most of the time spent at home. And if the veterinarian was not referring their clients to appropriate trainers, they could actually be undermining all the good work that they were doing trying to create a well-balanced, fear-free pet in the veterinary hospital. So education on fear-free techniques for not just in the vet hospital, but also in the home was launched as well. And that is a separate entity of Fear Free, which is fearfreehappyhomes.com. It's free to anyone. It's got lots of great resources on it. And it also has um, all the information has been vetted by either myself or my husband, Dr. Ken Martin, who is a board certified veterinary behaviorist here in the Austin, Texas area. 
obviously we work together. <laughs> and um, Fear Free Happy Homes has videos, has blogs, has articles, has all kinds of great information that's free. You just have to, you do have to give your email and your name and that's it uh, to sign up. So that's gonna be a really great resource going forward. Um, also what's really cool about Fear Free is they have uh, really tried to incorporate all animal professionals into Fear Free. It's not just veterinarians. It really takes a village. It's not just the veterinarian. It's not just the pet owner. It's not just the animal trainer or the consultant. It's not just the pet. It's kind of everyone working together. They have their roles that we can play. And I love that Miranda and every dog has really kind of reached out to the entire community here in Austin and try to be as inclusive as possible um, and, and bringing all of us together to help each other. So we're going to talk today. Uh, what I hope to give you is a, a really great tool to kind of look at any behavior that your dog's doing that may be driving you nuts. <laughs> Not that our dog's behaviors ever drive us nuts, I'm sure. Um, but oftentimes, you know, people want to know, why does my dog misbehave? And I put that in quotes. And then what can I do to fix it? Because again, oftentimes what we're going to see is behaviors that we think are misbehaving are probably normal dog behaviors. It's just things that we find undesirable. And so we'll go through kind of a model of how can we address those behaviors and identify them and find alternative behaviors that we would like for our pet to do. You might be at this point with your own dog. I want him to stop doing XYZ behavior. He's driving me nuts. Can't he just stop doing that? Well, it's not quite that simple. I wish it really was. And before we dive into talking about specifics of how to break down behaviors and find alternative behaviors for our dogs to do, it's really important to understand what makes a dog tick. Because if we're not meeting their, their general needs, their basic needs, you're gonna see an increase in those undesirable behaviors that they're exhibiting. So first we'll talk about the characteristics of dogs and that's gonna help us understand and build some empathy when we're asking them to live in our human domestic household and kind of go by our rules. Uh, sometimes those aren't as compatible together as we would like them to be. So one characteristics of dogs is that they are amoral. Now this is different than immoral. Amoral means you don't know right from wrong. So immoral is actually knowing right from wrong and choosing to do the wrong behavior. But amoral is they don't know right from wrong. And a lot of pet owners, even myself, used to doubt this uh, because I hear a lot of people say this, and I used to say it myself, is sometimes they look guilty. They look like they, they know they did wrong because of their be gestures that they're giving to us. I'll give you an example. This is what hit home for me. One of the first dogs, actually it was the first dog I ever had as an adult. His name was Snickers. He was a shepherd mix I got from the shelter. And just to give you a little background, when I picked him out, uh, he was 10 weeks old. And we went into the get to know you room. He hid in the corner and I thought that was cute. So Snickers is actually one of the reasons I am in animal behavior because I learned a lot from Snickers. He learned, he lived to be almost 16 years old and uh, was a great dog, great, great dog, but he had some challenges. Snickers was really sensitive to my moods um, or even just like little things. Like uh, example, I came home from work one day. My cat had thrown up on the carpet and I, was kind of exacerbated. I was just tired and, and now there's vomit on the carpet I have to pick up. And I did one of those uh, hands on the hips, big sigh. And Snickers looks at me, his ears go down, his tail goes tucked and he like slinks over to me all like trying to make up and kissy kissy. And it was obvious it was cat vomit on the carpet. I mean, it was that, you know, silicone cat food and hairball, all that kind of goodness sitting there. My dog didn't even eat it, which was amazing. <laughs> but Snickers acted like he was guilty. 
because he was picking up on my signal saying I was upset about something and he was trying to calm things down. So a lot of dogs will respond to our gestures or our response or even anticipate that we'll be upset about something and from previous experiences and then show those behaviors before we've even become upset. So what dogs really learn is what I call safe and unsafe. They can learn it's safe to do certain things when owners aren't around and it's unsafe to do them when people are in the room because they get fussed at or reprimanded. So they'll avoid doing them in your presence and they'll do them when you're not around. And again, that tends to lead owners to think that maybe their dog knows it's right and wrong, but really they just know safe and unsafe. Another characteristic of dogs is that they are constantly learning. This is really, really important to realize is that genetics play a role in what behaviors a specific breed or mixture of breeds a dog might exhibit, but the experiences are going to play a role too. And then what they learn through those experiences will go on with them into the next experiences that they have in the future. So they can start to predict when X happens, Y might happen, and then Z happens. So they have long lasting memories. Although they tend to live in the moment, they still remember things from the past. So they're constantly learning, even when we're not actively teaching something. Really important to realize because we don't set up the environment appropriately. They may be learning things we don't want them to learn. So they are also opportunistic. Carpe diem sees the moment. They live in the moment, like I said, but they, that doesn't mean that they can't remember things and that they can't, uh, they, they don't think to the future. I will say that. I think that we're, we're pretty sure that they can't think that far into the future. They kind of have the mentality of a two and a half year old human toddler. I used to be a preschool teacher before I became a veterinary technician, so probably why I gravitated towards animal behavior to begin with. But they are very opportunistic. So for example, if uh, they've got a turkey sandwich sitting on the coffee table and you go in the other room to get a drink out of the fridge, your dog smells that turkey sandwich and looks around, it's safe, there's no one around, maybe I'll just grab a little piece of that or the whole thing and take it. So they can actually be fairly opportunistic. Most dogs, uh, if they're healthy and, and emotionally stable, uh, tend to be curious. And with that curiosity, they also enjoy exploring things. So exploratory activities are really enriching for dogs as they are for people. Uh, finding activities that your dog likes to do and giving them opportunities to do them. So an example would be a food puzzle toy like this, giving them something to, Iris, this is uh, one of my dogs that passed away about a year ago. She was almost 15 at the time and uh, she was, had one eye. She was a little Beagle Jack Russell mix and she loved food and she loved working for food and working on puzzle toys and finding food. In fact, now that she's passed away, I realize that our Malinois are not very good at cleaning up crumbs off the floor. Iris was the crumb cleaner apparently and I have to do a lot more vacuuming <laughs> or I need to use more plates maybe. <laughs> I gotta change my behavior. So exploratory activities can be very enriching for dogs. They are also, they have this amazing sense of smell, amazing sense of smell and a very complex olfactory communication system that we can only start to think or possibly think how it might work. Um, you know, certainly the sense of smell is one reason that we use them for a variety of different activities. So for example, there are dogs that search for people, dogs that will alert a diabetic person that they're getting ready to have a crisis. So they can detect changes in chemicals within our own bodies, within human bodies, and be trained to uh, indicate when those changes are happening. So amazing sense of smell. There's so much information that they are picking up on that we can't detect. And, you know, it's just, it's kind of sad for us, uh, maybe overwhelming for some dogs. And sometimes that's where, you know, you have a dog that becomes frightened about something and you can't hear it or see or know maybe what that's coming from, but it could be something that they're actually smelling. 
when I lumped in olfactory communication here and pheromones. Um, pheromones are not something that dogs actually smell. They're actually chemical messages that they can detect. And they detect that um, by breathing it into their mouth. There's a little organ at the roof of their mouth that goes up into the nasal passages and into the limbic uh, center of the brain, which is kind of the emotional center of the brain. And they can pick up pheromones left by other animals of the same species that are, are stress or fear pheromones or also calming pheromones. So we can use that to our advantage by using things like Adaptal, which is a calming pheromone that's produced as a synthetic version of a calming pheromone that's produced by a lactating female dog. Dogs are social. They are a social species and through domestication, we have actually selected them to remain more juvenile and playful and enjoy physical contact and be very highly social. So important, we have to make sure that we're meeting that social need of theirs. Dogs are also predatory and that can be advantageous and it can be a disadvantage as well, especially if they're predatory toward things we don't want them to be predatory towards. But that's why dogs chase balls and retrieve balls. That's a predatory behavior is chasing and retrieving our predatory sequence, part of the predatory sequence. Breeds of dogs are going to vary in their degree of predatory behavior and individuals will vary as well. Uh, so that's one of those things like genetically, they may be predisposed to be more predatory I've got um, Malinois, they tend to be fairly predatory breed, uh, but there are onsets and offsets for all of these behaviors. And so if they don't have exposure to play, for example, if a puppy doesn't have exposure to a play before they're three to four months of age, it can be very difficult to teach them to play with things, even if they are a golden retriever and they're supposed to carry things around in their mouth. Another characteristic of dogs is that everything is a potential chew toy to them. So this is my, this was uh, Ileana, uh, so she's on the right and is the one that's straddling my husband's therapeutic pillow that was destroyed by them. And then Jasmine, who's on the left. And Ileana is the puppy that's on the cover of our, step, our Puppy Start Right book. And she, uh, they're about 10 months apart here. They're both adolescents. This is what happens when you don't supervise two adolescent Malinois in your house. Uh, the therapeutic pillow gets chewed up. You can see that in our house, it was a photo op. You can see how, you know, distressed my dogs are that we found them with this. It was not their fault. It was more our lack of management. And so they didn't get in trouble for it. There was no need to reprimand them for it. Everything's a chewed toy. And if I don't manage the environment, something's likely to be chewed up, especially with young dogs in the house until we get good habits established. What it's not about is not about dominant. In the media, there's still a lot of information out there that talks about dogs sharing uh, dominance hierarchies with people. You know, that all came from wolf, by, uh, wolf research that was on captive wolves that was not a natural wolf environment. Um, in fact, even now when they look at wolves in their packs, it's more of a parenting type, type of situation as opposed to a dominance hierarchy. If you look for dominance hierarchies, you can probably find them, um, but with dogs and even with other animals, it's not gonna transcend to people. We just don't have the same signaling capability um, and you going down that path of thinking my dog's doing something to dominate me, it creates problems with our relationships with our dogs. So there's no need to maintain a dominant relationship with our dogs. We want to do more of a parenting type technique and control their learning experiences and set them up to be successful. Dominant techniques, which usually um, are fairly confrontational, can be dangerous and very damaging to the human and animal bond. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick break here. Now, some of you know me fairly well on this webinar, so you'll probably get this answer pretty correct. Um, let me see if I can pull up the poll myself. Okay, so we're gonna do, um, we're just gonna launch the, well, I guess, I guess it's all together. So you're just gonna answer hmm, the first question and I'll launch the second one later. Okay, so let's gonna answer this. Uh, which activity is one of Debbie's hobby? Knitting, 
downhill skiing, dirt bike riding, or hot air balloon aeronaut? I don't know if you have to answer the second one right now. Hopefully not. We might answer it later. You can guess the name of my property. It's either Spicewood Heaven, Mal the Malamo, the Oasis, or Almost Heaven Ranch. There will not be any punishment if you get these questions wrong. We promise. No, there's not. <laughs> not. Oh, it's moving all around. Almost everyone's voted. 78% of people have voted. Well, okay, 85%. Anyone else? We're going to close the polls. Okay. So let's share the results. Okay, you guys can see these, right? Okay, so you guys, most people thought downhill skiing or knitting were the ones I would do. It is actually, and we'll, we'll get the answer to the other one later, but it is actually dirt bike riding and I have a little fun video. So this is at Hidden Falls out in Marble Falls, Texas here. There's my brave husband standing at the top of that mountain. It's a mountain in my book. So anyways, new, new hobby that I picked up. Let's talk about hobbies for dogs. Hobbies for dogs is meeting their needs. We've got to meet their needs in a variety of different ways. So we want to think about exploratory activities that we can provide, physical activities, and social activities. When a dog's basic needs are not being met, basic needs as far as these types of kind of enrichment type things, when these needs aren't being met, Oftentimes, those undesirable behaviors or those kind of pesty behaviors that drive us nuts are going to increase in frequency because they're asking for help and we need to provide them. So what are these basic needs? Exploratory behaviors, having foraging activities, a find it game where we actually put items out for them to find, whether it be toys or treats hidden uh, around the house. You can get pretty creative with this. Food puzzle toys, rather than feeding them out of a boring food bowl, provide a food puzzle toy if it's medically appropriate for them. I will say that right now, my house is full of, it's two geriatric dogs. Ileana is almost 13, and then Polo um, is a 15-year-old Malinois, and so they have a little bit more troubles with some of the food puzzle toys, and so we've had to make their feeding a little bit easier for them. Rotating toys to maintain novelty is also important. Just like us, we get kind of bored with the same old things, and you get something new. I don't know about you guys, but if I like get a new outfit or a new shirt, like that's the shirt I want to wear all the time right away. In fact, my husband always laughs at me. Like as soon as it comes in the mail, I've got to go try it on, <laughs> make sure. Or the next time we go somewhere, I've got the new shirt on. So rotating toys to maintain novelty can really keep them interesting for the dog. Uh, put two away and pull out two new ones each day. So you might have like 20 toys in a toy bin in the closet and you're just rotating out those toys. Sniff walks can be really important. Remember, their sense of smell is amazing. Allow them to take time to smell the roses when they're out on a walk. There's a lot of information gathering that they're getting when they're out on a walk. It's kind of like Google search for us. They're taking in lots of information that can be very enriching for them. Use caution with foraging activities in multiple pet households because if there's uh, competition between other dogs or even the cat who's like oh what's that treat uh, there could be some tension that's created between the animals in the household and it could be a dangerous situation so you really need to know your pets probably better if you have multiple pets to give them their own area to do some of these foraging activities by themselves uh, or with you present but not with all the dogs around competing or even the cat around competing for uh, items, food items, or toys that may be high value to at least one individual animal in the house. Other, uh, so physical and social activities, which are really enriching, are, are, can be short walks on leash. So when I talk about short walks, I'm talking like five to 10 minutes. It really doesn't have to be like an hour walk. 
to get enrichment in there, especially if we add in some training. So the owner, we really should be engaged with our pet during the walks. The worst thing you can do is ignore your pet when you're out for a walk with them. You want to be engaged with them, exploring things with them, smell the roses with them, you know, um, and then also do a little bit of training. Reinforce desired behaviors with special treats. Have a good time. One of my pet peeves is uh, that old saying, a tired pet is a good pet. I have had, up to, you know, we had three Belgian Malinois in our house at one point and pretty close in age. They were only a couple years apart. They are high energy dogs, but they don't require hours of activity. Short training session, short walks was enough to mentally engage them and physically exhaust them. So providing mental stimulation probably is more important than physically trying to exhaust your dog every day because all you're gonna do is create a marathon runner and they're gonna have more and more endurance and they're not using their brain necessarily if we're just trying to wear them out with exercise. So social interactions, mental stimulation, probably more important than the physical aspect of it. Moderate physical activity is important, but it shouldn't be overdone to the point of exhaustion. It can be detrimental to the joints of the pet as well as, um, I don't know about you guys, but when I overexercise and I hurt, I'm kind of cranky. My husband will attest to that. So um, it's not always a good idea to try to physically exhaust them. Social play with the owner. This is so important. It's so important for developing a relationship of trust and friendship and fun. It's really imperative that we help owners create a social play regimen with their dog in creating maybe games of tug or retrieve or um, even just like a hide and seek in the house. So those types of things where you're doing things together and enjoying each other's company. I'm going to show a short video just because it's fun to watch puppies play. Um, but this is going to show a video of appropriate and inappropriate play. This video demonstrates inappropriate and appropriate play with a puppy. Wrestling with our dogs can be fun, but it can be problematic if the puppy gets too excited and causes injury. Not everyone appreciates a puppy jumping on them and snapping at their face. It is important for puppy owners to decide what will be safe and appropriate play in their house from the beginning so the puppy learns the desired behavior early. Ultimately, it is probably better to teach a puppy to play with us with toys rather than biting at our hair and face. Notice how the person keeps the tug toy low to the ground to prevent jumping, and she gives gentle tugs on the toy from side to side, and lets the puppy win the toy. This makes for a calm and fun game together. Just some gentle tugs, not pulling too hard. Um, as they get older, you can do more Cues tugging. such as sit can be added into the game. See how she thought about going towards my hands there when I clapped my hands, but I redirected her right to that toy again. So I wanted her to think like, grab toys, not people, grab toys, not people. This is probably one of the first things. This is not uh, one of our dogs. This is actually a Belgian Tavern, which is one of my sister-in-law's dogs. But um, this is one of the first things I teach a Malinois puppy when it comes home or any malady breed of dog uh, or pretty much any puppy, <laughs> is get a toy to interact with your humans. Because if they have a toy in their mouth, they're not biting your hands and they're not nibbling on you um, and tearing your clothes because those little puppy teeth are pretty sharp. Social play with other pets. I get asked this question a lot. Uh, and a lot of people seem to think that that is a basic need of dogs. What I will tell you is that research doesn't show that. There's actually been research that shows that dogs, when given the choice, prefer, prefer human company. And that kind of makes sense. Like we actually have domesticated the dog and um, 
bred them so that they bond very strongly with humans. And in general, when dogs are given a choice to be with their people, so familiar people probably, uh, be with their people versus playing with less familiar dogs, uh, most of the time they're gonna choose their people. Doesn't mean that they can't have dog friends and they can't have great relationship with dogs. Obviously I have a multiple pet household, a multiple dog household. And um, I will say that some of the dogs I've lived with would have been much happier probably being just the only dog. And uh, Iris, our little beagle Jack Russell with the one eye, I think she thought we were going crazy when we kept getting all these Malinois. And she actually was this little 17 pound dog really kind of kept the Malinois in line, all three of them. She uh, kind of ruled the roost. She uh, definitely let them know that crumbs on the floor were hers, not theirs. <laughs> Maybe that's why they're not good at cleaning up. But dogs actually prefer human company. So it's, it's okay for your dog not to have lots of social dog friends. And some dogs prefer not to be around other dogs. So we don't have to force them to do that. And I think that can be a big relief for pet owners when they realize that, especially if they have a dog that isn't comfortable or hasn't had good experiences at a young age with a variety of different breeds of dogs and, and just lacks the social skills, but maybe they do okay with people and they can live a very fulfilled life without having lots of inter interactions with other dogs. Now there are dogs that really seem to enjoy and need some of that play with other dogs. However, it should not replace that social play between the pet owner and the dog. It's so imperative that that relationship be strong between the pet and their pet owner. Other physical and social activities that we can think about doing on a daily basis are just little positive reinforcement training sessions. So I usually suggest before feeding that you count out maybe five to 10 pieces of your dog's food or even some special treats and you do a short training session and we have fun. We teach them tricks. Learning should be fun. It should be fun for you and it should be fun for your dog. So learning or teaching your dog should be fun. If they make mistakes, no need to correct them or give them wrong signals. We're just gonna figure out a way to help them be more successful, get it right the next time, just as you were with a child, um, set them up to be successful, give them the guidance that they need and reinforce those desired behaviors. Creating a routine is really important as well. Consistency and predictability decreases stress in all of us. I'm sure all of us have, were feeling back in March when all these changes were happening with the COVID-19 changes in just our whole life, uh, a lot of stress because of unpredictability and lack of routine. Our routines got turned upside down. And I will say that I'm starting to get a better routine. Doesn't mean that there's still not some unpredictability about the world today that creates stress in us, but trying to have a set routine that we can stick to with our dogs can help them feel more uh, more comfortable and less stressed in their environment. So components of a routine would be walks and or play, training sessions, and exploratory activities every day. And here's just a quick screenshot of basically what an activity routine could look like for a dog. This would be like a minimum. And it doesn't always have to be at the same time every day. So it doesn't have to be at 6 a.m. every day, but maybe a window of time between 6 and 9 a.m. So for on the weekends when you want to sleep in, although some dogs don't understand that concept, um, but certainly trying to keep that routine within a certain block of time is really what we're talking about. So you might do a five minute leashed walk with some sniff breaks, then come back to the house, do a three to five minute training session with 30 to 50 small treats that you use or even some of their dog food, do a five minute play session with them. In fact, sometimes I incorporate play out on my walks as well. So we do some playing out there and some retrieving and then uh, get some new toys out and provide a meal and a food puzzle toy. So that would be the morning activities that you would do. And then in the evening, sometime between 4 and 8 p.m., maybe a little bit longer walk if you've got the time and your dog enjoys it with some sniff breaks in there, another short training session, and then provide them a foraging activity with a meal or um, followed by a meal if, uh, if that's not something that they're going to eat it out of. Let's talk about environmental management because that's going to help with our problem prevention as well. So we always want to think about setting puppies up 
and dogs up for success is kind of like that you wouldn't just let a toddler, human toddler, run around your house unsupervised. And so we have to be careful about the environment that we're setting up for puppies and dogs as well. So we wanna make sure we puppy proof so it's safe for everyone. But that also helps us control the learning history, especially if there are undesirable habits that have already developed, we have need to control that learning history. So we may need to manage the environment somewhat. That might mean blocking access to certain areas of the house or teaching the dog to be comfortable with being confined, whether in an exercise pen or a crate for short periods of time. Um, and then also, creating a way to supervise our dogs. And sometimes that might be having them on leash in situations where we haven't been able to advance their training to the level that we're ready to have them off leash and have them perform at the same level under the level of distractions that we're asking them to. So when we start to think about training, which is what we're getting into now, we wanna make sure we're using an approach that addresses behavior concerns without creating fear, anxiety, and stress in the pet. So a fear-free approach to addressing them. That's little Jasmine when she was the cutest little puppy ever. I'm not going to spend time talking about the four quadrants of <laughs> learning theory. Um, so positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. But I will say that with fear-free advocates, we're going to focus on positive reinforcement training, reinforcing desired behaviors so that they'll increase in frequency. So we're going to give something to the dog when they've performed a behavior that we like that's likely to make that behavior occur again in the future. And all the other ones we're gonna use with caution. We'll talk a little bit more about that. We may not use them at all, if at all possible. So the problems with adversives. Adversives can inhibit learning and reduce creativity, which is not what I want in a dog or a cat. I like this picture of this cat, that's why I put it in here. Because um, we think about it, cats, uh, although people do spray them with water and stuff, which is an aversive, but um, all aversives do is induce fear, anxiety, and or conflict with us, especially if the aversive is applied by the pet owner uh, or a person. It can damage a human-animal bond. If you like research, here is one for you that found that the human animal bond was damaged by using aversives in our training that the animal learns uh, that we're not trustworthy and they show more stress behaviors in the presence of that person. There is also risk of injury to owners. Dr. Heron did a study on that when she was at the University of Pennsylvania and found that using con uh, confrontational techniques and aversives with dogs increases risk of injury to the owners because the dogs are more likely to lash out, understandably. It's also inappropriate for teaching any new behaviors, like purposely adding adverses in to teach our dog something, just like us. I wouldn't want to, if I was learning math and I got the answer wrong, I wouldn't want to be slapped with a ruler on my hands. I'm, we used to treat teach that way years and years ago, uh, but it's not appropriate and it's not a fun way to learn. So it's not appropriate for teaching new behaviors or addressing behavioral problems because behavior problems or disorders are usually emotional disorders and emotions really aren't wrong. They just are what they are. If your dog's afraid of something and lashing out with aggression, that is just an emotion that the animal has and telling them to stop doing that or punishing them for doing that just inhibits the outward signs. It doesn't appease the motivation and it can actually justify their fear even further and make them a more dangerous dog in the long run. So what are alternatives to adversives? We've got several alternatives we can turn to. Environmental management, so controlling that learning history, making sure that we're managing our dog's environment so they're not getting into situations and learning things we don't want them to learn. So we control that learning history, teach an alternate behavior. So team up with a positive reinforcement trainer in your area, fear free trainer, and every dog can help you find someone to do that, or they can help you themselves. So teach an alternate behavior that is an acceptable behavior for you and also maybe appeases your dog's motivation. Funnel that behavior to a human approved activity. You can see this cartoon is the dog, adult dog store, and 
we can only guess what this dog's problem behavior is that they're trying to fix. Dr. Susan Friedman put this out. This is a, on her website, behaviorworks.org. You can also find her on Facebook at behaviorworks. But I really like this hierarchy of behavior change procedures. It, it just kind of makes us think about the processes that we're taking. If you're driving your car down this road and you have a behavior you want to change in your dog, your first exit is to think about, well, first I need to make sure that I have a dog that is nutritionally and physically healthy, right? So the veterinarian may be the first stop to make sure that there, especially if it's a sudden change in behavior, that there's not something going on that needs to be addressed medically in the dog. So that would always be our first step. You have to have a, a foundation of good physical and nutritional health in order to learn or to change behavior. The next stop along this path would be antecedent arrangements. So that's controlling that learning history, the environment of when things are happening. So we're going to set the stage or control the learning history for the animal so that they have more opportunities to make the right choice and less opportunities to make the wrong choice. And along with that, we're going to use positive reinforcement and reinforce those desired behaviors we want. Then you're going to see as we move up this road that there's a there's a little speed bump before we get to exit four which is differential reinforcement of alternate behaviors so giving a different behavior for the dog to do the reason that i think that speed bump is there because if you're having to redirect the dog that means we've already missed opportunities to arrange those antecedents and reinforce desired behavior proactively so it should make us think about our management strategies. Have we not managed the situation appropriately enough that now we've got the dog doing this undesirable behavior and we've got to redirect them. And then you see another speed bump and even a yield sign before we start thinking about extinction or negative reinforcement or negative punishment, which is um, just a little bit more intrusive and more frustrating and can create more conflict and stress in the animal. So we try not to get to those steps if at all possible. And then you see the another speed bump and a red stop sign and even a barrier if we think we're going to need to apply something aversive to kind of decrease behavior in the future in that bank account. It, that trust account can be broken because the dog uh, may learn to trust us less. Okay, so this is poll question number two. You guys already answered it. Um, and I will say that the answer was, let me go on to my picture, the Malamo, because we have Malinois and we live about an hour and a half from the Alamo. What's interesting, I actually looked up the meaning of Malamo in the Urban Dictionary, and it means the best of best friends. And I thought, oh, that's so sweet. But you know how Urban Dictionary is, because they always have to add a little something onto that that's kind of weird. So the second part of that was a person that you could shoot someone in front of, and they would say that person stepped in front of the bullet. <laughs> I said, whoa. <laughs> quite interesting, but uh, I like the best of best friends. That works for me. I'm sticking with that. So we call our property here in Spicewood the Malamo because we have the best of best friends and we have Malinois. Okay, now we're going to get to that behavior solution model that I promised we would get to. We had to get all that background information out of the way first because Oftentimes we don't need as much of this when we've pr provided our dogs with a good routine and we're meeting their needs. We'll have less behavior problems because we understand what their needs are and we understand some of the behaviors they do are just being dogs. They're not trying to be spiteful or mean. And so we have a different perspective. I mean, everyone has their own expectations for their dogs. And I will say that my dogs get to be dogs quite a bit, um, but that's okay in my household. And I understand if some people don't want their dogs to practice getting up on the island table so that we can do veterinary care there. Totally get it. But at my house, that's an appropriate behavior. In fact, my dogs will ask to be put up onto the island so that we can do some training up there. But uh, I'm one of those crazy dog people. 
this problem solving model is actually in the Puppy Start Right book. We're going to go through it. it. We've got four steps to it, the ABCs, the motivation, prevention and management, and solve it. So the ABCs, they stand for antecedent, behavior, and consequence. Our antecedents are what set the occasion for a behavior to occur. It's what precedes or prompts the actual behavior that we're talking about, okay? And when I think about the antecedent, I think about the four W's. Who's present? Where does the behavior occur? When does it occur? Is it a specific time of day? Does it only happen in the evening when the kids are coming home from school? Um, and what specific actions induce the behavior? So is it when uh, the kids are staring at the dog or it's during dinner time and someone gets up and leaves the table? You know, so what are the actual circumstances around the behavior occurring? The behavior itself is really quite a small piece of the puzzle because if we control the antecedents to these behaviors and we teach alternate behaviors, the behavior is going to change. Um, but uh, oftentimes this is the most pressing one for pet owners is the actual behavior itself. Like he barks all the times or he's always biting me. And then when we really break it down, we find the specific context that those things are happening. Um, might be a variety of different contexts with a variety of different motivations and, and ABCs to go with it. The consequence is what happens during the behavior and also immediately after the behavior. And those consequences generally are going to affect the future behavior. So if that behavior is maintaining or increasing, by definition, it is being reinforced in some way. Because the dog continues to do the behavior over and over again, that means there's something reinforcing in that is happening. There's some kind of reinforcement happening for that dog to continue to do that behavior. If, it's, if that behavior is decreasing, then e extinction, so I did that, nothing happened, um, so there is no, no real consequence to it, so I stopped doing that behavior. Um, or punishment has occurred in some way. The second step is to think about motivation for the behavior. Now we can get really like into lots of motivations for behavior. I mean, fear can be a motivation for behavior. Anxiety could be a motivation for behavior. Um, but what I really like to do is just simplify it. It's either socially motivated, that means they're trying to get the pet owner's attention or a person's attention. So socially motivated in some way, um, or it's self-reinforcing. So if the owner weren't there, the dog would still do it. Or it could be both. So there are some behaviors that, can fall into that category. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, motivation, when we think about motivation and consequences, some people would say, well, you know what? The consequence doesn't seem very enjoyable for the dog. For example, this Weimaraner here that had to run in with a uh, porcupine multiple times, you would think that the consequence of getting stuck by the quills would stop the dog from doing that behavior. But sometimes when the motivation's high enough, they'll still perform that behavior. An example is um, one of my dogs, Jasmine, she, for some reason, decided that 3 a.m. was a really good time to go out the doggy door and find skunks in the backyard. And she did this like two days in a row until the human person realized I need to change the antecedent arrangement because I don't want to keep bathing my dog at three o'clock in the morning when she comes in rubbing her face <laughs> on the bed smelling like skunk. So we locked the doggy door for a while and the skunks seemed to have moved on at that point and we'd stopped getting them. But you would think like after the first time getting sprayed by the skunk, which she didn't particularly enjoy, that she wouldn't still be hunting for skunks whenever possible because still throughout her life, there were times that she would have a run in with a skunk. And what's interesting is to this day, I love the smell of skunk because it reminds me of my little jasmine. We can also move on to, so we've done the ABC, we've identified ABCs, antecedent behavior consequence. We've decided, is it socially motivated? Is it self-reinforcing? Could it be both? Um, and now we have to think about can we prevent or manage these behaviors from happening altogether? And there's lots of things that we can do here. First is we wanna be proactive versus reactive. I think our tendency, just as humans in general, 
uh, is, you know, like if it's not broken, don't fix it, you know? So we tend to ignore desirable behaviors and uh, just kind of wait and see and then do damage control later. So be proactive. If, if your dog has made poor choices in the past, rather than waiting to see if he's gonna make that poor choice again, ask him to do something that else that can make him successful and that you can reinforce. Also, reinforce desired behaviors often, just like with kids and also with dogs and husbands and spouses. Oftentimes, we ignore them when they're being good and we give them tons of attention when they're annoying us or getting into trouble. So reinforce desired behaviors often because behaviors that are reinforced will increase in frequency. So catch your dog doing things you like, like playing with their toys on their own, um, asking to go outside when they have got to go potty, uh, noticing that person outside the window, but not barking at them. So before they've started barking, reinforce those desired behaviors and they will increase in frequency. Control the antecedents. So if you have a dog that likes to bark out windows at people passing by your house and in their mind, they bark at them and the person moves on, so they were successful, then control the antecedent. Try to block access to the house during busy time or access to the window during busy times of the day when there's more likely to be people passing by. So they're not practicing that behavior or set up a training session and actually reinforce that desired behavior or teach them an alternate behavior. When they see people outside the window, go ring a bell or grab your toy and shake it. So there are a variety of different things we can teach them. And then supervision. So if you have a dog that's out in the backyard digging holes in your, in your garden, well, they're gonna continue digging holes in your garden because it's fun. You can give them an appropriate digging spot reinforce them for digging in a digging spot. But unless you supervise them, they may go back to digging holes in your garden because there might be critters or something that they're digging for. So we wanna make sure we're preventing and managing the practice of those undesirable behaviors as much as possible. With prevention and management, we also want to think about those routines we were talking about and having exploratory activities available, meeting those physical and social needs, because if we're not meeting those, we're more likely to see those behaviors creeping in. And then if we've not been successful at managing or preventing the behavior from happening, and it's actually happening right now at the moment, we've got kind of two options of how we handle that. So we can either ignore the behavior, so when we ignore the behavior, it's usually because it has nothing, or it has to do with getting our attention. So we might just let it go into extinction. We avoid giving them attention for that behavior if possible. Or we use a technique called response substitution. So when we talk about ignoring, the we're only gonna do that if it's a socially motivated behavior. So they're trying to get your attention for something. Maybe they're nudging you or asking to play ball and it's not time yet to play ball. Um, so we might ignore that behavior instead of reinforcing it. Because if we don't ignore it, we potentially can be reinforcing even if we're telling our dogs to knock it off. So eye contact can sometimes be a re enough of a reinforcer for a dog to kind of perpetuate that behavior that we're trying to ignore. And it might get worse at first. And I will say that extinction can be quite difficult for us to do, and it can be really stressful for the animal, especially if there's been a long learning history of it working. So if you have a dog that is barked at you while you're eating dinner and you always give them food for that, um, trying to put that into extinction is gonna be quite difficult. You're really probably gonna to have to do a little bit more work on that end, um, manage the environment and also teach them alternate behavior to do to get a reinforcer because extinction is gonna kind of be stressful for you as well as for them. And it works best if it's not a long established behavior, something that is just creeped up and we just choose to ignore it. Instead of extinction, focus on proactively redirecting or directing the pet to the appropriate behavior before they've made the wrong choice. So for example, that dog that tends to bark at you when you're eating dinner or begs, um, give them something to do. Maybe that's the time that they get their food puzzle toy and they're off in another room doing that while you're having dinner and you don't have to worry about managing your dog throughout your meal. 
Response substitution is when we can't ignore. So let's say it's a self-reinforcing behavior or maybe we can't ignore it because it actually hurts. They're jumping on us or something like that or it's potentially dangerous. So in this context, we would interrupt. So the interrupter is gonna be non-confrontational. It's just, it's gonna be something like, or clapping your hands, saying their name in an upbeat tone. So it shouldn't frighten them. It should just be meant to kind of get their attention and get them off of whatever they're doing. And then we cue them a behavior we've already taught them. So it might be come, sit, go to your place. And then we reinforce that alternate behavior. Really, really important that we are proactively redirecting our dogs as much as possible. You can teach your dog to get into trouble so that you will redirect them and reinforce them. Happens all the time if we're not doing all those prevention and management type things. I taught Iris uh, to run out the doggy door, bark at squirrels, and come back in and sit and get a treat because I only reinforced her or called her in when she went out barking. So one day, you know, I, well, I decided, oh, I'm going to work on this training thing. She keeps going out, barking at squirrels in the tree, and I'll, I'll call her back in. Her recall was great. She'd come in, she'd sit, she'd get a treat. And then I was actually sitting there working at the computer, and I saw out of the corner of my eye, little Iris looking at me, and she runs out the doggy door, goes, woof, 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 runs back in, sits in front of me, like, where's my treat? Because I'd never called her in when she wasn't barking at something. So she's like, I think I can make my person get me treats by doing this whole sequence of behaviors. So that's why that prevention and management is so important. And um, positive, proactive redirection and setting them up to be successful. We want to avoid punishment because it doesn't appease the motivation. It may suppress behavior. Punishment works. There's no doubt about that. Science tells us punishment can decrease behavior but it doesn't appease that motivation. And what the pet usually learns is it's unsafe when people are around and people are not trustworthy at times because they're unpredictable. Instead, we wanna teach and reinforce that desired behavior from the start. So we've got the behavior solution summary, the ABC, step one, motivation, prevention management, and then solve it. I'm gonna go through just one example of jumping, which is a very common behavior that dogs do, and we'll apply this whole process to it, and then we'll open it up for questions. So we always have to remember, though, for those undesirable behaviors, instead of saying, I want Fido to stop doing XYZ behavior, we want to identify what you want your pet to do instead. So for jumping, this is a normal and affectionate and greeting behavior. This is Jasmine. She is quite the jumper. Can you see those springs for legs? My goodness, she's very acrobatic there. Um, we actually, so I'm one of those people, I, I like my dog to jump up on me when I ask them to. So we put this on cue. We actually will put jumping on cue so we can ask for it if we want to, uh, but then we can also ask for something else. So the ABCs of jumping, the antecedents. Well, people have to be present if we're talking about the dog jumping on people. And I did say it's already, that it's a normal social behavior of dogs. The behavior itself, well, we'll just say it's jumping on people. It could be the owners, it could be strangers. Sometimes they just jump on strangers. Sometimes they just jump on owners. So with, your, with yourself or with your clients, if you're a dog trainer, you're gonna wanna look into like, what are the specific people that this is happening to? And then the consequences. What's the reaction from the person? There's usually some sort of reaction. And like I alluded to earlier, sometimes eye contact is all it takes to maintain that behavior. Some dogs will work for eye contact alone. Just a glance over in their direction can be enough to be like, yep, got their attention. So I kind of led into this. What's the probable motivation for jumping? And let's see, I can't see the chat right now, but I'll bet. Okay, now I can see it. So anyone um, have any ideas what the probable motivation would be for jumping in general? Would it be socially motivated, self-reinforcing, or potentially both? Someone said socially motivated. Yay. Hey, Andrea. <laughs> Definitely, definitely could be socially motivated. Um, it could also be both. There are some dogs that I find that just, yep, Stacy saw that the contact of 
hitting their bouncing off of you like whether you can ignore them as much as you want but just hitting your legs and maybe even doing like one of the swimmer turns can be actually really reinforcing for some dogs uh, so it tends to be socially motivated like they're trying to interact with us in some way or greet us in some way and uh, but it also could be self-motivating or uh, self-reinforcing as well okay so let's go on to prevention so what are things we can do <clears throat> We want to try to be as proactive as possible. So we provide those routine walks, play, and training. That's going to help keep them from bouncing off the walls and bouncing off people. Be calm with our greetings, our interactions. So we're controlling that in seat. We're not coming in like all, getting the dog all excited, which is going to encourage jumping. We can cue the dog to sit prior to giving attention at all times so that that becomes kind of the default behavior for the dog to do. So we get in the practice of reinforcing sitting for attention. And reinforce the desired behaviors that are being offered. There are so many times pre-COVID when I've been working with clients um, and when I used to do in-home mobile visits too, uh, that the dog wouldn't be jumping, would not be jumping, would not be jumping. And you could see like the dog was like, hey, I'm here. Nobody's paying attention to me. I've got four feet on the floor. No one's paying attention to me. And when that doesn't work, they jump up because they're like, nobody's paying attention, this will work. And then they get told to sit or told to get down or they get the eye contact that they're looking for. So reinforce that desired behavior before the dog makes the mistake of jumping up and us having to redirect them. Control those antecedents. So it might mean having to have the dog on leash or in another room when people are coming into the house. So if it's with visitors coming into the home, we might need to manage the initial excitement of someone new coming into the house to prevent the practice of those undesirable behaviors while we're working on teaching the dog the new behavior we want them to do. And supervision, so we, we keep close tabs on them. If we haven't been successful at managing or preventing it, and you can't manage and prevent everything, uh, we might try to ignore it if possible. So sometimes that's just kind of moving away or trying to avoid eye contact, taking a step away if the dog jumps up towards us. We could use response substitution. So we could ask them to sit. So usually I do a combination of that where like if the dog, if I haven't been proactive and the dog's actively coming in for a jump, I might step back and just turn slightly away. And then as our feet hit the ground, I would ask them to sit. We can train a new behavior. So instead of uh, jumping on us, going to four feet on the floor, go to your bed, or even just a sit behavior. Really important we avoid any form of punishment. The reason being with jumping, so think of this, this is a natural greeting behavior. So like for us, a natural greeting behavior pre-COVID was to reach out and shake hands, right? And smile. So I, I know like it's awkward now, like you feel kind of rude when you're not doing that with people. <laughs> but um, that was a very natural behavior for us, this a friendly greeting when you're meeting somebody. And so think of jumping as that friendly greeting that dogs are giving us. Can you imagine if you reach your hand out to meet somebody and greet them and they yelled at you or berated you and it wasn't because it was during a pandemic. Um, they were just acting abnormal. You can see how your trust factor with people would decrease because you were trying to be friendly and social and they became confrontational with you and you haven't learned what is the appropriate greeting. Here's a video of some jumping and working with a puppy. Jumping is a common greeting behavior of dogs. If we want dogs to greet people differently, we need to focus our attention on reinforcing a desired behavior such as four feet on the floor. With this puppy, in this training session, the person is proactively marking with a click the behavior of all four feet on the floor. Because dogs will gravitate towards a spot of reinforcement, delivering the treat near the floor can be beneficial. He's a good dog. He's a good dog. Now, C Copper right here is a really good example of a dog that really likes to jump up. He gets so excited and wants to fly up with all of his paws. Reinforcing Copper for having all four feet on the floor is the first step. You can see he is now offering to sit and waiting rather than jumping. Reinforcing that behavior often will instill a new habit. You're doing so good, buddy. So you can see the trainer there actually caught him, you know, just offering those behaviors and stopped reinforcing the undesirable jumping behaviors. Jumping is oh, a common sorry. greeting behavior. Get to the video. So 
human responses often perpetuate jumping and it's going to be a combination of management and training when we're addressing any kind of behavior problem or undesirable behavior whether it's a normal behavior of dogs to do or maybe one that's driven by fear anxiety or stress i um I'm not really talking about behaviors that are motivated by fear, but I think that what's important to realize is that if that is underlying cause of the behavior for that dog, that's kind of driving that behavior or maintaining that behavior, it's really important to treat that fear condition first. You're, it's really hard to learn something if you're frightened. And that may be either um, working with a veterinarian that is comfortable with nutraceuticals or pharmaceuticals, um, and then also working with a really great trainer that understands how to set that animal up to be successful um, and work at their point of uh, ability to work in that situation. So we wouldn't want to like just smack them into a situation of like a full-blown panic attack and then try to train them something new. That's not going to work. Uh, just like us, if we're panicked or afraid for our lives, you, it's not easy to learn something new and you're usually not very hungry or interested in treats either in that context. So it would be important to set them up to be successful at a place a non-stressful starting point when we're addressing a fear kind of component to an undesirable behavior. So you're going to have these tools to go out and apply to any type of behavior that you find undesirable with your dog. You always have to think about those ABCs. Sometimes you have to revisit them because you may have not picked up all those antecedents that you wanted or the consequences that were happening because sometimes it's just a guess. It's not always right. It's a hypothesis. Um, and then we think about what could be motivating those behavior. How do we prevent or manage them? And then if we're in the moment, have a plan for how you're going to solve it without using adversives to do it, not just inhibiting their behavior. So we want to think about using response substitution or withdrawing attention or ignoring the behavior if possible. Some resources for you, fearfreehappyhomes.com, great resource I talked about earlier. Also fearfreepets.com, so you can find fear-free individuals at veterinary hospitals, also trainers, groomers are also on there. There's also a new fear-free course for shelter employees and workers as well. So quite a bit of educational information for animal professionals, but also you can find resources for help on those websites. Also, Puppy Start Right, and I'm actually going to give away a copy of the Puppy Start Right book, and I meant to mention that earlier during, our, uh, during the beginning of the presentation so that you'd hang on to the end, but if you hung on to the end, you're basically going to have an hour, so by 8.15 tonight, you need to send me an email at info at veterinarybehavior.com. And in that email, I want you to share one, at least one takeaway that you got from this presentation today. Um, and you'll be entered into a drawing. I'll do a, a drawing for the Puppy Start Right book. If you win, I will email you and send you a, a copy of the book in the mail. Okay. Um, so let's do this. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hopefully you got info at veterinarybehavior.com there. Couple websites for you. Team Animal Behavior is a website that my husband and I put together. It's got uh, free webinars on there on a variety of behavior topics. So check it out. Um, and then veterinarybehavior.com. That's our business here in Austin, Spicewood, Texas, actually west of Austin, uh, that addresses behavior conditions in dogs and cats. So information for you there. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can see everyone and I can see the comment section again a little bit better in the chat. Okay. I couldn't see the chat during the thing. I saw little things popping up, but I couldn't see them. So I'll have to read through those. We don't have any no questions. questions yet okay. that I have seen. If y'all have questions, we still have a little bit of time for anyone who can stick around. Yes, I'm sorry. Miranda made the mistake of saying, well, it's like an hour, but you can go over. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad thing to do with someone who's very passionate <laughs> about animal behavior. And I love to tell stories about all the mistakes I've made with my own animals. <laughs> Any questions for Debbie while we have her here? Thank you, Stacy. I appreciate your comment.
Ooh, someone had a question, maybe? Yeah. So Andrea asks, what do you think about dogs who have fear-based behaviors happening in our absence? Yeah, so it's hard. Um, it's really hard to redirect them, obviously, if we're not there. So uh, I'm going to assume you're talking like maybe about separation anxiety or storms. So sounds. A sound happens when you're not home um, and the dog panics. Like let's say the smoke detector goes off or a thunderstorm happens and you're not home. That tends to be a common one of fear-based behavior happening in our absence. Kind of the rule of thumb, at least in veterinary behavior, is that if we cannot control at, um, the exposure to a stimulus and it creates a strong panic attack or fear response in the animal, that the temporary use of anxiolytics is going to be really important because dogs have long lasting memories. So if they, you know, nine times out of 10, they were fine with being left home, home alone, there wasn't any storm that came through, or they did well with most storms, but then there was a really bad storm. Um, they're going to remember that adrenaline response that they had, that fear response they had that consolidates those memories and makes it so they don't forget them. It's a natural survival, survival mechanism. So oftentimes it involves some kind of um, either dietary supplements or pharmaceuticals, um, depending on the level of anxiety, temporarily to help them work through that as we do some behavior modification to teach them better coping skills, like trying to find their own safe place during fearful times so they can self-soothe. Um, but when they're when we can't control those triggers or that exposure like we can't control mother nature um, oftentimes we do have to reach for something and thankfully we have a lot of great tools that we can do that don't like zonk the dog out necessarily um, they can still learn through those things they're just not as afraid so okay. awesome. that's a good well, question Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. A client has a very sweet but demanding dog, gets mouthy and shoves his nose anywhere he wants, will grab your clothes and shoelaces, etc. When he is bored or wants something and he is very smart, so picked up on the fact that he'll get treats after he gets nosy and all he has to do is sit. Is it a timing issue to be able to interrupt and reward for alternate behaviors and be sure he doesn't chain? Yeah, so I think so. And, and um, I, I would guess that there are particular times that it's more likely to happen. So if they keep a log and figure out exactly the, when it's happening and then proactively maybe get the dog something to do before then, it probably tends to be a time when there are other busy things going on in the house and the dog's being ignored. And so can we manage him away from them during that time? Um, and oftentimes it tends to be worse probably on days when they haven't been able to meet all of his needs. Ileana, puppy on the puppy start right book, right? She had learned, she learned early on as a puppy uh, when we had not given her all her enrichment for the day, like she hadn't gotten her short walk or a training session and we were ignoring her in the evening time, she would go and grab the kitchen dish towel off the counter. And so she, I mean, she would look at you and go over to the counter and like, just gently go out there and grab it off the counter and like prance right past you. Like, look what I have. Um, Cause I think the first time she did it, I went, oh, look what your dog's doing. <laughs> Not my dog. <laughs> and uh, that was, that, that perpetuated for the, she still would do that time at times, but we just kind of ignore it. And then she gives up and it's a sign to us that we haven't given her not enough enrichment that day. And so making sure they're getting their needs met on a schedule so the dog can know when those needs are going to be met would be important. Um, and then if they see the dog coming in to do the behavior, so if they can see like, Oh, he's coming, right? He's bringing that nose, um, trying to cue him alternate behavior beforehand before he kind of chains it together, right? So a hard one to ignore for sure. A dog, smart dog. Okay. Do you think that genetics motivates behaviors as much as social motivation? Is it a type of self-motivation? What can we do to help dogs who have fearfulness that is genetically based? So genetics uh, and uh, social motivation. So I'm not sure that the social motivation goes together necessarily. So genetics, um, 
And when we think about people, so I like to give analogies with people too, is when we think about uh, the social nature of people, like we're, we're considered a social species in general, but we all know that social is different for individuals, right? Some people really thrive with lots of uh, meeting lots of strangers and activities. Other people would rather just their select group of friends and dogs are no different than that. So the genetic makeup of what we find socially enjoyable can not only change throughout the life of the animal as well as the life of the person. Um, some of that might be genetically related, but probably more experience related too. Um, but dogs that are maybe genetically fearful, oftentimes there could be some brain development that did not occur or abnormal brain development um, in utero. So the fearfulness of the mother, the uh, stress factors of the mother when she's pregnant, as well as her nutrition can affect the behavior of her puppies. And so if they had poor nutrition, the mother was under a lot of stress, um, oftentimes those puppies have more difficulty adapting to stressful environments, maybe will be more fearful. Um, certainly there can be a genetic component to that. Uh, how much is genetic and how much is learned, it's variable. If you see it in a really young puppy, I think that you have indicators. I will tell you that Ileana, when we got her as a puppy, um, she had a fear of strangers already at eight weeks old. And uh, there is a reason she never did formal competition because of that. Um, even though we might have been able to work through the training part of it, it would not have been something she would have enjoyed. And we weren't going to force her to do something we wanted to do with her uh, just because it was something we wanted to do because we saw that kind of those fear components in there. But it doesn't mean you can't make them the best dog that they can be. And when there is underlying fear that's inhibiting the learning of behavior, we have to get that under control in order to actually teach something new. Okay. All right. So I don't see any other questions coming through, although if I do, feel free to still post them on there. We still got a little bit of time. Um, but thank you so much again to Debbie for coming out today and talking to us about this. Um, Debbie is one of the, the big teachers for Fear Free. And so if you want to learn more about Fear Free, it's a really cool organization and a really cool movement. Um, and they have programs for folks who work in vet clinics, for shelter workers, for dog trainers, all kinds of really cool stuff um, and pretty in-depth programming. So definitely check that out. Um, again, my name is Miranda. I'm one of the founders of Every Dog Behavior and Training. We are trying to make uh, behavior resources more available to the community. So please share us with your friends. We're new this year, so we want people to know that we're here. Um, and we have free webinars every couple of weeks. We have a regular monthly webinar for people who have just gotten a new dog, or even if it's not just gotten a new dog, it could be a dog they've had in the family for a while, but they just want some basic information. Um, we're always here for those webinars. We are also launching some, uh, some classes and some private sessions online coming up soon, um, but we do have our free behavior consultations uh, for anyone in the Austin area, so you can sign up for those. I know some folks in their notes signing up for this webinar uh, mentioned some things going on with their own personal dogs that were um, you know, either behavior issues or things that they wanted to get sorted out. So if this webinar didn't give you, you know, everything that you feel like you need to solve those problems on your own, schedule schedule a consult and we'll be happy to work through those things with you um, and so i will hopefully get this up tomorrow for whatever reason it takes a long time to upload to youtube um, <laughs> but i will get this uploaded and i will send you all the link to it you're welcome to share with anybody you would like to um, and i'll also shoot you the links for our facebook and our instagram if you're not already following and links to review us on either facebook Book or Google if you would like to do so. Um, and if you ever have questions or you want to do something with us, please, please go ahead and shoot us an email either at info at everydogaustin.org or back at my email, which is Miranda. So thank you all for coming out on a Tuesday evening. And again, thank you so much, Debbie, for this. I know um, there are a lot of folks that weren't able to make it tonight, but are super excited to watch later. Thank so, you. Thank you for yeah. having me. You guys have a great night. Good Bye. night.